What if somebody gave you a birthday gift? It's valuable, it's expensive, it's costly. And let's imagine that the gift could somehow change the direction of your life. Might even determine what you do for a living. But you never open the gift. It just sits there. It's costly. Somebody paid a lot for it. It could change a lot about your life and change everything about your life. But you never open it. It just, it just sits there. And you continue to drift and not know what to do. That's kind of like the scenario with Christians and spiritual gifts to a large degree. At your spiritual birth, God gave you at least one spiritual gift, maybe more than one. In fact, some people have said spiritual gifts are God's birthday gift to you to serve Him. But so many believers never open the gift. They don't know what spiritual gifts are, and they don't know what their particular spiritual gift is. Even though the gift is costly and valuable and expensive and directs your life, in fact, in my case and other cases, it's, it lets you know what to do for a living. It's a vocation. But sometimes we, we never open them. So this morning, for the next six Sundays, we're going through a series entitled Understanding Your Spiritual Gifts. I want to help you know what spiritual gifts are and what your particular spiritual gifts are so you can use them, and I'll share with you how to use those in the next few weeks. First of all, the very first thing, the most important thing in life is knowing that you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's the most important part, that that there's been a time in your life that you have prayed with your own lips from your own genuine heart, Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins, rose again. He took my place, and I submit my life to you and invite you into my life. And you must do that at some point in your life. If you've never done that, that's where you need to begin this morning. And everything else I say from here on, you can ignore Because that's the most important thing you need to do this morning. But if you've done that, if there's been a time you've submitted your life to Christ and you're a believer and you're born again, then the rest of the message is for you. God would have us to serve the gifts He's given us. So I want you to listen to what Paul said to the church at Corinth, chapter 12 of the first letter. Uh, to the Corinthians concerning spiritual gifts. Verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Some of your translations say ignorant. Now the rest of chapter 12 I'm going to go through this morning and looking at guidelines as to how to use your spiritual giftedness. First question may be, Pastor, what is a spiritual gift? It is a supernatural ability God gave you at conversion so that you can advance His kingdom. A a special ability God gave you when you got saved that will help you expand the kingdom of God. Now, I'll be honest, I I don't know why God did it this way. I really don't. I mean, it seems kind of risky to me. That, that he, is, he is putting all of the advancement of the gospel on you and me, sinners, people who fail. I, I mean, it, it seems to me he ought to do that. Let, let angels do that, you know. Let, let angels come down to earth and advance the gospel and share the gospel and advance the kingdom or, or create a special kind of being that doesn't sin, that's consistent and faithful and effective And let them spread the gospel and advance the kingdom. Or why doesn't he just do it himself? This voice booms every 30 minutes. The plan of salvation to everybody on the planet. And the kingdom is advanced through God alone. That's not what he chose. You know what he chose? He chose to give you gifts. So you do it. 
Seems kind of risky to me, but that's, that's what he chose. And he chose 20 spiritual gifts. There are only 20 of them. That's all. You've got one of them. 20 if you count celibacy, uh, 19 if you don't. I, some theologians back and forth on whether celibacy is a spiritual gift. I think it is. I think there are 20 of them that are listed. There are no more than 20. Sometimes people say, well, I have this gift. No, no, that may be a talent. I'll talk about that in a moment. It's not a gift. There are only 20. They're all listed in the Bible. So the Bible has an exhaustive list of every single spiritual gift. There will be no more than 20 ever, and there will be no less than 20. So you've got one of the 20. Now, over the course of the next several weeks, I'm going to share with you what those 20 gifts are. I'm going to explain what they are and explain how to use them because you've got one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four of them. So I'm going to explain what they are. But this morning, to begin with, their 2 Corinthians chapter 12 gives us eight guidelines as to how to use them. So this morning, I want us to look at eight guidelines for using spiritual gifts before we start looking at what the 20 are. So let's look at the guidelines. Number one, the first guideline, God wants you to know and use your spiritual gifts. God wants you to know and use your spiritual gifts. Did you notice in verse 1, brothers, I would not that you would be uninformed or ignorant about spiritual gifts. The word uninformed there in the Greek language is the word agnio. Now, the word gnosis in, in Greek is the word to know something. So if you put the A in front of it, it negates it. So agnosis or agnio it means not knowing. I don't want you to be not knowing about spiritual gifts, unknowing, uninformed. So God wants us to do this study. I've been feeling like he's wanting us to do this for a while. He wants us to do these six weeks because he does not want you uninformed. Now, by the same token, the enemy, the devil, does not want us to do this study. I can promise you that. He doesn't want you to know your spiritual gifts. Because if you don't know your spiritual gifts, you'll drift through life. You'll always figure out what you're trying to do. You're not, you'll never feel fulfilled in a purpose of why God has placed you here. You'll be ineffective in your service. So he is pleased if you stay uninformed. He doesn't want this study. He wants this church to remain irrelevant. He wants this church to try to be ineffective. He, he doesn't mind us gathering. Oh, he's fine with you gathering on Sunday morning and saying hi to everybody. And oh, I just love my church. As long as you don't go out and do anything about it. He's fine. You just huddle behind the stained glass. You just do your thing and leave and don't be different. And he's fine. But if you start to discover your spiritual gift and use it and the kingdom is actually advanced, he doesn't like it. You know, it has been my experience through the years that Christians are uninformed about their spiritual gifts. They don't know what they are. If I were to ask you this morning, could you name 20? Could you name five? Whenever you ask somebody their spiritual gift, what is your spiritual gift? Most of them look at you and pause because I've done it. They look at you and they pause and then they kind of make up something like, well, I, I try to be good. I, I try to help people. They don't know. They don't know their spiritual gift. And Paul said, I don't want you to be that way. I, I want you to know. Guideline number two, spiritual gifts are not natural talents. Spiritual gifts are not natural talents. There's a difference between a talent and a gift. 
Verse 1, Paul uses the word for spiritual gifts, pneumatikos. It is an adjective, it's a genitive, it's plural. It means they are spiritual in nature. So there's a difference between what God has given you that's spiritual in nature and what you have as just a talent. Let me, let me share with you the difference between a talent and a gift. A talent, you, you're probably born with it. You're good at it. Your parents are probably good at it. Your grandparents were good at it. It's genetic. You got it when you were born. It's a talent. A gift. You weren't born with it. You got it when you got saved. So if you got saved at 10 years old, for the first 10 years, you didn't have it. It's a gift. It's, a, it's something spiritual that you got at spiritual birth. A talent, maybe you inherited from your parents, but a gift you got from God, not from your parents. A talent you can have before you're saved. A gift you don't have before you're saved. A talent is natural. A gift is supernatural. A talent can be any ability you have. A gift is one of 20, and that's all. No more, no less. A talent. Anybody can have. Lost people are talented. The lost people don't have spiritual gifts. So there's a big difference between a talent. Now, we are to use both for the glory of God. You can use talents and should use talents for the glory of God, but you also use your spiritual gifts for the glory of God. What are some talents? I've had a lot of people confuse the two. They call a talent their gift. It's not. For example, I asked one man a while back, your spiritual gift, and he said, well, I'm good with numbers. I always have been. Always good. I'm good with numbers. No, that's a talent. There's not a spiritual gift in the Bible that says, thou shalt be good with numbers. Or I'm good with finances. It's a talent. Or intelligent. Maybe you're smart. That's not a gift. It's a talent. Lost people can be smart. Or maybe cooking. I did a revival at a church one time. This lady says, Pastor, my spiritual gift is baking cherry pies. <laughs> oh, she was right. She was good at it. But it's a talent. That's not your gift. Nothing in Scripture. But cherry pies. Or maybe your athletic ability. It's a talent. Or maybe you can draw. It's a talent. Maybe, maybe you can paint. It's a talent. It's not a gift. Maybe you're good at building and design. Maybe you can speak multiple languages. Maybe you're good at, at photography. That's a talent. Maybe you have a green thumb. Maybe you can good at public speaking. Those are talents. Music is a talent. I've had people say, oh, my spiritual gift, I, I sing out on the praise team. That's wonderful, but it's not your gift. That's your talent. Use your talent for the Lord. They did this morning. Beautiful. But they're talented. Music is not listed as one of the 20. So it's a talent. And whenever you're saved, your talent doesn't turn into your gift. It doesn't. It's separate. So, use your talents for the Lord, but know your spiritual gifts and use those for the Lord. Guideline number three, spiritual gifts are given and empowered by God. Spiritual gifts are given and empowered by God. Verse 6 says, there are a variety of gifts, but it's the same God who empowers all of them. The word empower there is the word energo. In Greek, it, it, it's, we get the word energy from it. It means, it, it means what we know it to mean, power or energy, and God gives it. Verse 11, 
all of these gifts are in ergo empowered by the one and same Spirit. So God is telling us, I give you the gift and I empower you to use the gift. Now here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes we try to use those gifts in our own power. And what happens is you're going to burn out. I don't know how many times people come, Pastor, I just, I need to take a break, man. I, I need to stop teaching my class for a while. I need to stop being a deacon for a while. I need, to, I need to stop being on committees for a while. I am burned out. That's because you're doing it in your power. You see, whenever you actually use the God's gifts he's given you in the power of the Holy Spirit, you love it. You want to do it again tomorrow. You love it. And he empowers you, and other people are blessed, and you feel good. You don't burn out. God is the one that gifts you and empowers you, according to Paul. Guideline number four. Each believer has at least one spiritual gift. Every believer has at least one spiritual gift. Now look at verse 11. All of these gifts empowered by one and the same Spirit. Look at the next phrase. Who apportions to each one individually. A portion. It's, it's, a, it's a compound word that means to cut up and pass out. Cut up and distribute something. So God distributes gifts to each one, means each and every, Individual, idios is the word, it means privately or yours. So if you put all that phrase together, God is the one, takes the gifts, divides them up, and gives it to you individually, privately, you personally, your gift. Every Christian has at least one. Some Christians have more than one. Some have two, three, four. No Christian has all 20. I've met some people that think they do. They don't. Nobody has all 20. But most Christians don't believe it when I say that. Oh, Pastor, I, I, I can't do anything. I, I'm, I'm not real talented. No, let's see where the word talent. I'm not, I'm not real talented. I, I can't do a whole lot. I can't do much. I don't have any spiritual gifts. I don't know what they could be. And that sounds humble, but it's really a shot at God. Because he said he has gifted you. And you say he hasn't. Sometimes senior adults feel this way. Well, pastor, my best days are behind me. I, I'm older. I don't have as much energy and strength, and my earning power is gone, and I just don't have much to offer. But you know, your spiritual giftedness does not leave. You may use your spiritual gift in a different way, but you can still use it to be a blessing to the kingdom. And as long as he's given you breath... No matter your age, he can use you for the kingdom. So just because you think you're not as useful as before, that's up to God. If he's left you here, there's a reason. Guideline number five. God determines your spiritual gifts, not you. God determines your spiritual gifts, not you. Verse 11, notice it's a key verse, empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually. Notice the last three words of the verse, as he wills. As he wills. Kathos bulamai literally means as he has purposed or as he has minded. So in other words, 
God gives you the gifts He wants you to have. Sometimes we have a problem with that. We want certain gifts. But God is the one that gifts us. Charismatics. Some of them want the gift of tongues. Oh my goodness. I, oh, I want the gift of tongues because they see tongues as more spiritual. Tongues as more godly and more holy. And if I speak in tongues, that proves that I'm close to God. And that proves that I'm saved. And it proves all these things. And that's, they have that in their minds. I'll talk about tongues in, in a couple of weeks. Are they being used correctly? Oh, we'll talk about all that. But they desperately want it. Folks, God is the one that gives the gifts. You don't have to try to conjure it up yourself because you want it so badly. God gives them. Do you know you can go to a Christian bookstore and get a speaking in tongues starter kit? <laughs> Serious. I'm not joking. They had them. It's a starter kit. There are certain words you repeat over and over and over and over and over real fast. And maybe that gets you jump started. No, no. God gives the gifts as he wills. Now, Baptists, let's talk about us for a moment. We're bad, at, we're bad about it as well. Some of us want the gift of teaching so badly. Brother Dennis, give me a Sunday school class. I'm a teacher. And you're not gifted at it. And you're subjecting those poor class members to that. And you're not gifted. Don't do that. God has given you the gifts He wants you to have. You're not going to be good at it. They're not going to enjoy it. And you're keeping somebody who is gifted from using their gift. Don't desire, oh, I, I would love so much if I could be a teacher, if I could be a preacher. God gives you the gifts He wills for a reason. Because what He's gifted you at, you're going to be good at. And others are going to be blessed and the kingdom's going to be advanced. But don't desire a gift you don't have just because you think it's more important or cool or just because you want it. God gives them, not you. Guideline number six spiritual gifts are for the church not to be used selfishly by you. Spiritual gifts are for the church. Verses 12 through 20, Paul then goes on talking about the gifts God gave for the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts are not for your self-gratification. Boy, pastor, I wish I could do this, or I wish I could do that. And in your mind, you have envisioned, oh, everybody's going to praise me for being so good at that. They're not for you. They're not for you to feel good. Now, you will feel good when you use your spiritual gifts. That's not the reason. The purpose is to build up the church. They're to be used to build up the body of Christ to advance the kingdom. Not your kingdom, not your name, not your bank account, not your fame. The church. Spiritual gifts are for the body. A lot of Christians don't realize that. They think they're for themselves. No. They're for the body of Christ. So I'm ask you a question. If you're not active in church anywhere, how are you using your spiritual gifts? If you're not active, how do you use them? Oh, well, I go out in the community and I try to do this and I try to do that. Remember, they're for the body to be built up that the kingdom's advanced. So how do you use them? If you're joining us online, we're glad that you are. But how do you use your gifts online if you're never here? You can worship with us. If you're physically unable to get here, you're joining us by online, we're glad you are. And you might have to think different ways to use your spiritual giftedness. You can still use those. You might have to think if differently by not being in the body. How does the body get built up? And God can use you. 
But you might have to think how, because the gifts are not for you. They're for the body. You know, Paul then goes on in chapter 12 to start talking about the body itself. It has a lot of members. He says, many members, a lot of different functions, one body. Our physical body is the same way. I have a lot of body parts. Paul says, a hand can't say, I'm not a part of the body because I'm a hand. Sure, it's a part of the body. Or an ear can't say, I'm not an eye, so I'm not a part of the body. People don't look into my ears and say, oh, how beautiful. They look into the eyes and say, how beautiful. I want to be an eye. It doesn't mean you don't need your ears. Because Paul said, if if the whole body's an ear, how do you see? If everybody in the church is a teacher, who listens? Who's taught? And so he uses the analogy of a physical body, saying God has arranged the members. If you only have one member, where's the body? So there are many parts to the body, not just one. People don't see me walking by and say, oh, there goes Pastor Greg's ear. No, they say, there goes Pastor Greg, because they see me as a whole. And every member is for the body, not for you individually to be selfish with it. Do you know what happens in your body when a part of your body gets selfish? When a cell takes on a life of itself and goes rogue? I don't want to be a part of the body anymore. I'm going to do my own thing. It's called cancer. And that cancer cell gets all the nutrients and all the nutrition and all everything, and it takes it away from the body because it wants it for itself, and it grows and grows and grows, and the body gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Same concept should be no selfish members in the body. We're here as one body, the body of Christ. We're just individual members with different gifts. Guideline number seven. No spiritual gift is more important than another one. No spiritual gift is more important than another one. Verses 21 to 23 they thought in Corinth one gift was more important than another one. Sometimes we think one gift is more important than another one. They thought it. They got in their minds, if we can only speak in tongues, if we can only do this, if we can only do that, we're going to be more important than anybody else in the body. And Paul says, no, every gift in the body is important. Sometimes we can think that way. Man, if you're on the platform on Sunday morning, you're important. No, it's just one gift out of many. You're just as important. There are a lot of people in this church that make Sunday mornings happen. You never see. You don't even know their name. And they're vital. Just because you're not on the platform or you're not teaching in front of a class doesn't mean you're not important. Every single member of our body is important. We may never see you up here. It's okay. Use your giftedness where you are, and you're just as vital as anybody up here. Because no gift is more important than another gift, regardless of how visible. Well, if I could only be in administration and help lead the church, you don't have to be. You're vital with your gift, whatever it is. It's needed here. You're part of the body. And then Paul asks a question. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Then he asks a question. What if the whole body was an eye? Think about that. What if the entire body was just one big eyeball? No matter how pretty the eyeball is, it looks weird. You remember Monsters University and Mike Wazowski? Look at this. It's just an eyeball. Got braces on a few teeth, but... Now, that's not pretty. That's just an eyeball. That's the question Paul asked. What if the whole church were an eye? The body wouldn't look very good. So the parts of the body that seem to be weaker, he said, are indispensable. And those that we think are less honorable, there's still greater honor. 
Don't look down on a gift just because you don't think it's important or it can't be seen. From time to time, I will have a gout flare up where my feet, my big toe kills me. I don't think any of you have probably ever seen my big toe. It's not visible. But you let that thing hurt and it affects my whole body and you'll see that. You'll see me drag it along and you'll see my face flush and you'll see my whole body because of a part you can't see. But it's really important to me. And you may never be seen here, but God sees. And you're needed to make this body healthy and whole and function. Guideline number eight. Spiritual gifts are to unify the church. Verses 25 and 26. Spiritual gifts are to unify, unify the church. Spiritual gifts sometimes divide the church. They did at Corinth. I know churches today divided over spiritual gifts. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to unify, bring the church together. Verse 25, God gives gifts, quote, that there be no division in the body, but the members have the same care one for another. Verse 26, one member suffers, they all suffer. One member's honored, they're all honored. God gave us gifts to unify us and make us one. Can you imagine what this church would be like if every single member of the body used their spiritual gift? Wow. You're already a great church. You really are the best church I've ever been I've ever known. But can you imagine how much greater we could be if every single one didn't try to take a gift that wasn't theirs, use the gift God gave them to advance the kingdom? Can you imagine what God can do and how the kingdom would be impacted and Garland would be different? Because this church is a unified body advancing the kingdom. Niccolo Paganini was an Italian violinist, early 1800s, left his mark on modern violin technique. You'll see a picture of Niccolo there. Just before he died in May of 1840, Paganini willed his famous violin to the city of his birth, Genoa. He wanted to, he wanted to do something and give back to the city which had given so much to him. So just before he died, he willed his beautiful violin to the city under one condition. Nobody ever touches it. Nobody ever plays it. Nobody ever touches it. Encase it. Keep it as a shrine, but do not use it. There was one problem. The wood the violin was made from is the kind of wood that whenever you handle it and use it and touch it, it stays vital. It shows a little wear. But when you put it up and ignore it, it decays. And this exquisite, mellow tone violin in its beautiful case became this decaying relic. Good reminder for us that a life that is never used or uses its spiritual gifts and just withdraws loses its meaning. You're best used when you know your gift and God empowers it through you. I don't want you to be ignorant unformed about your spiritual gifts. Father, I want to thank you today for, the, for your word that's throughout this entire chapter 12. You inspired through the Holy Spirit for Paul to write. Lord, I, I pray that you will intersect that passage with uh, members of First Baptist Garland so that, Lord, we will know our gifts. You will empower them through us 
we will use the gifts you've given and not try to use gifts that you have not given to us. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless and empower this time, this invitation. God, for those people that have never received Jesus as Savior and Lord, I pray this will be their moment that they'd walk forward today and receive Christ. Never said a prayer of faith to receive Jesus. God, I also pray for those that are believers today, that they too would respond to you and seeking out your giftedness that you have for them. God bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen.